in a world torn apart. Mrs. Witt, what I'm about to say is extremely difficult. How long do I have to live? In a land where love can be your greatest enemy. This is not your life anymore. Sometimes danger can be your best friend. I'm fighter pilot Jack Johnson. Critics are calling, ejaculating into the swan, the breakthrough hit of their trousers. I received knock at no. Prime Minister, quick question. The seat was sticky when I left, says the Daily Mail. We are the government. Now they're saying that we in the Labour Party are anti-Semitic. That's what the defendant, Little Joe, would like us to do. I became hard and then came, says the Guardian. Our island is very divided politically now. I am here to study insect and plant life in the city. When courage is the greatest love. Joke. I'm speaking to you as your wife. Sometimes love is the greatest courage. Were you aware, Mr. Franken, that it is considered a hate crime to make fun of hate crimes? This is not a cry for help. Featuring the new single by Papua New Guinea, In the Day of the Year of the Night of the Morning of Love. In the day of the year of the night of the morning of love. Jack Johnson. I'm a pilot with the U.S. Air Force. Heimlich Maneuver. I believe in freedom. Will Franken. I'm not the one on trial here today. Jason Posner. You've been dead for three months. And Melissa Molinaro as Mrs. Witt. I'd like a second opinion. Ejaculating into the swan opens Friday. And now, we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Mrs. Witt. Thank you, Robert. Come on in. Oh, Robert. That will be all. Having delivered the file, the unseen character makes his way back to the door. Yes, the door. Robert, can you shut the door, please? Slam. Thank you, Robert. Mrs. Witt, this is Dr. Jason Posner. Uh, Mrs. Witt, I'm not too sure I can hear you right now. I have my middle finger stuck in my ear. <laughs> Where are you exactly? Under my fingernail. Okay, Mrs. Witt, can you move a can you move a bit closer to my tympanic membrane? Great, I can hear you fine. Uh, Mrs. Witt, the reason I've stuck my middle finger in my ear this morning is I have your results back from the lab. What I'm about to say is extremely difficult. You have cancer. You're going to die. Oh, that was pretty easy, actually. Uh, did you get that, Mrs. Witt? Yep, you're gonna die. How long do you have to live? Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not your regular doctor. Your regular doctor is Dr. Jason Posner. I'm Dr. Jason Posner. Yes, we do have the same name. That is the name of every doctor here at the hospital. It does tend to get quite confusing. Calling Dr. Posner, Dr. Jason Posner. Calling Dr. Posner, Dr. Jason Posner. 
Sorry, Mrs. Witt, I thought they were calling my name. Uh, Mrs. Witt, at this uh, difficult time, I'm required by the NHS to ask if you have a preference as to who you would like to portray you in a possible heartwarming, uplifting movie about your life. Emma Thompson, yes, yeah, she's really good. Uh, if we couldn't get her, Meryl Streep, yeah. Actually, uh, Mrs. Witt, if you wouldn't mind me making a suggestion, would you ever consider somebody like Melissa Molinaro? Mrs. Witt? Melissa Molinaro, she's really good. She, uh, what has she been in? Uh, she played Nookie in Jersey Shore Shark Attack. Uh, she had an uncredited role as a soldier's girlfriend in the 2002 thriller High Crimes. Actually, you know what, Mrs. Witt? I actually have Melissa Molinaro in my office. I tell you what I could do. I could pull my middle finger out of my ear, stick it in her ear, and have her speak to you through me. You bet. One second. I've been in a number of things. I played Nookie in Jersey Shore Shark Attack. I also had an uncredited role as a soldier's girlfriend in the 2002 thriller High Crimes. Dr. Posner? Yes, Mrs. Witt, he's still here. One second. Mrs. Witt, what do you think? I should get my nurses to set a contract? You'd like to play yourself. Uh, yep, that would lend some authenticity to the role, but that's going to require you surviving. I'm sure that would be nice, but that's not the best thing for your career, is it? Now, Mrs. Witt, she's really good. you got to love her. She's a great actress. Mrs. Witt, trust me. She's really... Mrs. Witt! Melissa Molinaro is going to play you in a movie about your life, whether you like it or not. This is not your life anymore. It's ours. Good day. Well, congratulations, Mrs. Witt. You got the part, Melissa. Should we run lines? Let's do it. <laughs> Mrs. Witt, you're going to die. Who would you like to play you in a movie about your life? Emma Thompson. She's good, but if we couldn't get her, Meryl Streep. What about Melissa Molinaro? Melissa who? Melissa Molinaro. She's great. What's she been in? She played Nookie in Jersey Shore Shark Attack. I'd like to play myself, Mrs. Witt. You can't play yourself. I'd like to play myself, Mrs. Witt. You can't play yourself. I'd like to play myself, Mrs. Witt. Sins. When I'm reminded of my sins, I'm reminded that I'm not perfect. <laughs> 
fuck. <laughs> Every gangster bitch deserves <laughs> fucking. Nobody's perfect. Oh, folks, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that Owen Scotland isn't God. But how could God be in Scotland? Maybe that O is you. That's right. The people of Scotland. So I'm going to tell you something now, folks, and you better believe me when I say to you. I said, You, you're supposed to come into the last chord and go, oh! I should have explained that. Because so you're, you're the Owen Scotland. You'll say, so can we do it again? And the last chord just go, oh! Yeah, Leslie can. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Ready? And again. <clears throat> now I know. Look, it's real simple. <laughs> right, you're the O in Scotland, right? So let, 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 let me make it easy for you. Um, right. this, this is you, right? You're the O in Scotland. So can we, can we just, let's just, let's just say the first part of this together. Can everybody can see in the back? It was the first part of this. The second part. you. That's all you are. Now again, it's feeling. <laughs> now I know you're nothing more than oh! Folks, I'd like to apologize. I was a little brusque there. And it's been a trying festival. Um, you know, I had you sus totally wrong. Uh, this isn't you at all. Um, if you didn't join in, I don't blame you because it's quite insulting. It's a fucking zero, isn't it? <laughs> That's not you at all. You're not a negation by all means. No, um, you're actually something more like this. <laughs> Can everybody see this in the back? This in the back? Um, it's kind of like a cosmic sunflower. Uh, see, each one of us here tonight is a different petal, or, uh, or individual, or, or I, that when gathered together like we are tonight, only vaguely give off the illusion of being an O. So let's just do this. Instead of saying O, let's just say we're a bunch of different eyes that vaguely resemble an O. Lots of them. And again. <laughs> Now I know you're nothing more than a we're a bunch of different eyes that they resemble now. I don't really want to stop the show, but I thought you might like to know. I know the nerves come along to say some things that might seem wrong. So let me introduce to you the one and only little Joe, a major Yorkshire's tea and pudding shop. Oh, it's great to be a top for that introduction. That was quite lovely. How are we? Yeah. Oh, it's great to be here. I've been quite busy lately. I've been working on children's story. Children's story called Little Joe. Little Joe by Little Joe. You see, folks, one night I was drawing pentagram. I used to draw lots of pentagrams. I used to be graphic designer for Church of Satan. <laughs> well, one night after drawing a pentagram, I received no at door. It was Resin Corpse of Beatrix Potter, children's author. She wanted no bad typewriter. She'd been dead a long time. We were keen to get back to writing. So I sat her down a laptop, but she couldn't use keyboard. Her hands were all withered and frail and skeletal. So I volunteered to transcribe what were in her head. It was quite difficult to make out what she was saying. She was zombie and all. And it all came out a bit like, I am the Resin Corpse. I'll be your <laughs> So I just transcribed over my own head. And that's when I came up with a story of Little Joe. 
<laughs> you see, folks, uh, little George is a magical creature. It lives on the other side of the river. And not to the bank, but to the side. The river's got four sides, you see. One bank, to the bank, upside where birds and angels live, and underside, which is water, which is where little Joe lived. But little Joe weren't fish. Little Joe were half big, half rabbit. Top half of little Joe, top half of pig. Bottom half of little Joe, top half of rabbit. Two top hats, <laughs> neither a fish living in water. Which meant in order to stay alive, little Joe had to spin round and round for all eternity. Spin that water from both mouths. Well, I worked on story for five long years when suddenly it occurred to me, it's not a very good story. It's just Joe spinning round and round, 1,500 pages. That's when I realized to make a much better fountain. So, I developed work and project prototype and took it down to corporate headquarters and met with the American CEO. Okay, so what do you have from here? It's Fountain called Little Joe. Half big, half rabbit spins round and round for all eternity. Okay, can you hold on for just a second? Mary, uh, who is this person in Helling at my office? Oh, okay, yep, you're fired. Uh, I tell you what, why don't, we, uh, why don't we wait on this? It's great that if a fountain is not water and all. Right, but everything that has water is not a fountain. This is a glass of water, you wouldn't call that a fountain. It could be if you put a little, little Joe in there, instead of an ice cube. If you put a little, little Joe, it'd be all in the fucking look, man. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I am the head of a major financial institution. You have acute schizophrenia, so I'm going to write you a prescription for Paloxin. Take that to the concierge, she'll fill that out for you. Hey, you're absolutely right. I will stop raving mad. <laughs> Once I accepted that fact, I will quite come. It meant I didn't pay bills anymore. And I could sit around all day long and watch Joe spin round and round me. Could you please leave? We are in the middle of a board meeting. Thank you. Nigel, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so uh, where are we with uh, fourth quarter profits? Uh, right, with fourth quarter, I would just refer you gentlemen to the presentation here. Uh, I like to use what I call Tiny Jim. Uh, Tiny Jim is a half cheetah, half sloth. Uh, the top half of Tiny Jim is the top half of a cheetah, which represents the speed with which new technologies are being developed. Uh, the bottom half of Tiny Jim is the top half of a sloth, which represents the slowness with which emerging markets can take on these new technologies. Uh, now, of course, uh, Tiny Jim lives in the global marketplace, which is water, which means order to stay alive, it's got to spin round and round for all it's going to Please leave! Go! <laughs> Nigel, I don't know how that happened again. Uh, so where are we with the uh, fourth quarter? Uh, right, fourth quarter. Uh, I guess it takes all kinds. Uh, fourth quarter, I would just say, uh, he lives in the water and he spins round and round. No! <laughs> Nigel, where are we with fourth quarter? Must be something in the water. Spinning round. Okay, that, time out, time out, guys. Now, something's going on here today, but we're businessmen. We're going to get through this, okay? Uh, Nigel, is, is, uh, is everything okay at home? Everything's perfectly fine. I'm just a bit under stretch. I'm all completely bad. I'm ropeable. Okay, Nigel, you've been with this company for 25 years, so you're fired. Get the fuck out. Uh, Bob, uh, Nigel's been taken over by a Yorkshireman, so bring us up to speed. Where are we with the uh, fourth quarter? Well, the fourth quarter is really all going to depend on the budget. So we'll know more once the budget comes out. I can't say more when the budget comes out. Um, I do know that the Chancellor is meeting with the PM at this moment, so perhaps we can have a little listen in. Theresa. Oh, sorry, Prime Minister. Still also new to me. Uh, uh, quick question. Uh, will I go out there tomorrow with that red lunchbox thing? Uh, do I say anything? Or, no, just let me get a few photographs and you can bugger off. Cool. And that is the budget in that red lunchbox. That is the budget, yes. You don't need to explain it or open it up. It's just a few photographs and you can fuck off. Cool, cool. Just a bit nervous. I've not been in a play before. We're not in a play. I thought we were going to play by the government. No, we are the government. We are the government! So you really are the Prime Minister? Yes, and you're really the Chancellor. Wow. We are the government. <laughs> I can relax now. Anyone can be in the government. Yes, it's true. Anyone can be in the government. And now with Brexit, there's never been a better time to get in on the ground floor. Hi, I'm Will Franken. I work hard and I play even harder. Sometimes I get in trouble because I don't work as hard as I play. In fact, my boss last week, he said, hey, what's going on? When we hired you, we thought you would work as hard as you play. But for the last six months, all you've been doing is showing up and playing. Every morning you come here with your toys. They're not even adult toys, no dildos. It's just tin soldiers and dollhouses. You got a cubicle filled with stuffed animals. You got a, you got ri rhinos and lions. You got that creepy one's a half big, half rabbit. She's been drowned and round for all Nigel, 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 Nigel. I fired you, remember? So pack your shit and get the fuck out. So, Bob, you're saying it's going to come down to the budget. It will all come down to the budget. Uh, I can't say that most accounts are showing a profit. Uh, there is one account with a slight deficit in the amount of uh, £267.47, but uh, that's quite negligible. Uh, so questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Joffa Cakes. £267.47 is a negligible amount. 
Gentlemen, when I ran this bank, there was no such thing as a negligible amount. Bartholomew, take a letter. Dear Mr. Franken, our records indicate that your account is overdue in the amount of 267 pounds, 47 pence. If this amount is not paid in full by Thursday of next week, this bank will have no other option but to kill ourselves. <laughs> this is not a cry for help. We are not a teenage girl. We are a bank, and we demand to be treated with the same respect every bank deserves. As of three months ago, we began to self-harm, mostly small cuts and burns on our forearms. This did not get your attention. Your prior credit history indicates your last two banks ended up in A&E having their stomachs pumped. We felt at the time you truly loved us. We hope we were not mistaken. If we were, there will be blood on your hands, and you may consider this letter a suicide note. I mean it. I have my hands tied behind my back. If I do not receive this money, I shall jump from the Westminster Bridge, land in the water, where I shall either perish or spend the rest of eternity spinning round. <laughs> Strike that last bit, Bartholomew. Uh, yours sincerely, uh, Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC, Deutsche Bank. For more information, contact the following number 26747, 26747, 26747. Thank you for calling Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC, Deutsche Bank. This is Mahosh Nash. To whom am I speaking? Mr. Fregan. Oh, yes, no one wants a bank to kill himself, but we prevent this terrible tragedy from occurring, Mr. Fregan. First, before we continue, Mr. Fregan, I must ask you a few security questions to prove you truly are, Mr. Fregan. Are you ready for the first security question, Mr. Fregan? Very well, we begin. The first security question. It is bigger, bigger than a golf ball, but it is not as big, not as big as two golf balls. <laughs> what is it? No, Mr. Franklin, it is one and a half golf balls. What do you We have another security question for you. Next security question, Mr. Franklin. It is bigger, bigger than a spoon the size of Luxembourg. But it is not as big, not as big as a spoon the size of France. What is it? No, Mr. Franklin, it is a spoon the size of Belgium. I am so sorry, Mr. Franklin. Well, yes, I call you Mr. Franklin because I believe you are Mr. Franklin, but it is not me you have to impress, Mr. Franklin. It is the system. You must impress the system. And that is your problem, Mr. Franklin. You have never tried to impress the system. <laughs> sorry, I lose my temper. I tell you what I'll do, Mr. Franklin. I will go to my supervisor and get another security question. Very well. I will place you on hold, Mr. Franklin. Mahashnash went to ask his supervisor, Utu, for a new security question. Utu was excited because soon would be the Shahana festival, and there would be many berries and mangoes and kalana beans. Princess Ganene would be there, along with King Feifei. Hello, do you like stories from other cultures? <laughs> well, I don't. They're forcing me to read these every day. I'm fighter pilot Jack Johnson. I'm a fighter pilot with the US Air Force. My plane was shot down by the US Air Force. I'm being held hostage by the US Air Force, and they're forcing me to learn about diversity. I just want to get out there and kill the enemy. Tell my wife and children I love them, and I'll probably see him next weekend. He's coming back. I gotta go. <coughs> Utu said goodbye to Mahashnash and gave him many berries and mangoes and a new security question. Soon Mahashnash was back down the hall and in his seat again. Mr. Fagan, mm -hmm. did you enjoy the story? Yes, it is much better than Vivaldi, yes. <laughs> Very well, we have one more security question for you. This is, the big, this is the big chance. This is for the access to your own account. Here we go. <laughs> Last security question. It is bigger, bigger than something not as big. Not as big. But it is not as big, not as big, as something bigger, bigger. What is it? No, Mr. Franken, it is what it is. I am so sorry, you can call back. Call back tomorrow, ask for me, I am Mr. Franken. Yes, you did not answer the security question. Somebody must be Mr. Franken, I think I will be him. So call tomorrow, ask for, no, call tomorrow, not, no, wait, no, not today, call tomorrow. No, listen, go to sleep and call tomorrow. Go to sleep, go to sleep, call tomorrow, not today. Go, go to sleep, go to sleep. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Good Morning, Good Morning. I'm Michael Good. 
And I'm Kathy Morning. And we are the, the same, same person. person. So, Kathy, no need for you today. Cool. Have a good morning. You too, Kathy. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> later, later, we'll talk to a man who lost all of his money when he thought a cash point was a video game that he was winning. <laughs> <laughs> the man is now suing his own brain for being so stupid. And later, we'll see how the Labour Party is dealing with accusations of anti Semitism. Now they're saying that we in the Labour Party are anti Semitic. And I say they can take that sort of Nazi Hitler, Bergen Belsen, Auschwitz, Smugstacks, Yellow Stars, Bars of Soap, Lampshades, and Frank's Diary hate speech and fuck right off. <laughs> now I don't want to trivialize the Holocaust, if it even happened. But if you don't know your history, your history knows you. We've got that to look forward to later. And then we'll meet a comedian who's come under fire for a Holocaust bit. That was not a Holocaust bit. So you're denying the Holocaust bit. <laughs> there was no Holocaust bit. So you're a Holocaust bit denier. <laughs> We've got that to look forward to as well. But right now, my first guest, my first guest is a man who was in downtown Manhattan on the morning of the 11th of September 2001, when everybody else with the video camera that day were filming the two towers. He was filming a caterpillar on a leaf. <laughs> he is entomologist Dr. Robert Heinemann. Uh, Dr. Heinemann, thank you for joining us. And many people tapped you on the shoulder that day and said, what's wrong with you? Turn around. There's something happening right behind you should be filming, uh, but what did you say? I said I'm here to study insect and plant life in the city and I will not be deterred from my task. And it's good that you are not because your video of a caterpillar on the leaf has now been put forth for a Nobel Prize in science. So let's take a look at that clip together and you can sort of walk us through what we're seeing. Absolutely. Well this is the Bambi woolly bear caterpillar um, and its the scientific name is Proractica Isabella. And what I find fascinating about this caterpillar is it's eating at a rate that's five to six percent faster than the caterpillar the species would have been eating 10 to 12 years prior to the taking of this video. Um, so we estimate that number in the 15 years that have elapsed to be now as high as 37 to 38 percent. Astounding. And what do you think accounts for the changes in eating habits? Well, because of man's activities on the planet, there have been various fluctuations in temperature, and so the caterpillar has adapted or evolved to eat more accordingly, even more warmer climates. You can see from the video here, it's a very mild day, very mild for September, and there's a cloud of smoke which indicates a fire in the distance. Uh, of course, adding to the warming and other manly activity, which is added to the caterpillar's appetite, and if left unchecked over time, will seriously decrease plant life. Astounding. Now, I'm no scientist, but I am a television. Presenter. And this would seem to confirm what many experts in my field believe is the real threat facing us today is global warming. Absolutely. Or if it's colder, climate change. Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. What an amazing clip. And thank you for joining us. You've been watching the left and now over on the right. Sharia court is now in session. All rise for the honorable Sharia judge, Michael J. Sharia, presiding. Be seated. I have had a chance to review the evidence in this case, and I believe based on that evidence and the testimony of witnesses here today, you are a woman. Court finds in favor of the man. Next case. <laughs> <laughs> Young man, I have never seen you before. Therefore, no more warnings. You are homosexual and will hang by your neck until dead. <laughs> really, your honor? Even if I'm wearing the scarf of protection? Hmm. We could use the propaganda. Very well, we will use this to hang you by your neck. Sharia court is adjourned. <laughs> Mr. Franken, that was a sketch from your 2016 Fringe show, which according to your notes you call Sharia court. Is that correct? Mr. Franken, would you speak up so the court could hear you? I said yes, that is correct. It is correct. From there you went on to do another sketch, which according to your notes you call Western court. In fact, Mr. Franken, that's the sketch we're in right now, <laughs> isn't it, Mr. Franken? <laughs> sorry, Mr. Franken, you have a line here. I'm sorry, I didn't see that one. Uh, yes, it is correct. It is correct. <laughs> a sketch in which you've got a lawyer, played by me, is some sort of pompous, blowhard, elitist, Ivy League law school graduate. Would that be a fair characterization of your characterization to me, Mr. Franken? Yeah, you're doing a really good job, too. Thank you, Mr. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, your own lawyer is represented as a kindly New York Jew. Objection, Your Honor. My client's representation of me is the material. I'll withdraw the question. Mr. Frank, have you ever been to law school? No, I got my degree in restoration in 18th century British literature. I see. So how are we expected to believe you know anything at all about what a lawyer sounds like? I've been arrested a few times, and I just get bored in court and watch you guys talk your bullshit. <laughs> talk our bullshit. So in your legal opinion, that's what a lawyer does. We just stand up here and talk a little bullshit. 
Speak a little gobbledygook. Doesn't have to make sense. We can just go hoopy doopy dab do. Bambi doopy dab do. Hello, my little you're watching the BBC World Service. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go out and ask people what they thought about the referendum. So you've got the camera, just follow me around. Just get a few vox pops on Brexit, so uh, just follow me around with the camera. So I don't want to talk to him, he's got a suit. Uh, she looks a bit well to do. Uh, oh, how about this man on the pavement drinking cider? Hello, we're from television. Would you like an entire case of cider? Tom, get to, what is your name? Grit. Get Grit an entire case of cider. Grit, I've got a few questions for you. Uh, Grit, what do you think the referendum was about? About free trade, being able to shop ourselves, what nations we trade with. Okay, okay, um, what else could it have been about? Could have been about national sovereignty, restoring democratic principles. Do, 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 do. <laughs> do you think it might have had something to do with the word beginning with I? Ideas, innovation, integrity. <laughs> Let me give you a clue. <laughs> Immigrants? Perfect. Okay. Here's your side. Enjoy your side. Uh, we can't use all of this. So I think what we should do, let's cut right before it says the word immigrants, and then cut right after it says the word immigrants, and then just run the word immigrants on a loop, and I can say something over the top. Like, this one man speaks for over 17 million people tonight in a Britain fueled by hatred, a hatred fueled by racism, a racism fueled by Brexit, a Brexit fueled by racism and hatred in a racist, hate-filled Britain. All because people like him went into a polling booth and next to the word leave wrote one of these. <laughs> Mr. Franken, this was the spot where you put a big X, was it not? No shit. I'll take that as a yes. From there, you went on to put another X <laughs> right across our beloved prophet, peace be upon him. Objection, Your Honor, that is not the prophet, peace be upon him. That is a cartoon of the prophet, peace be upon him. He's insulted the prophet, peace be upon him, Your Honor. He has etched out the prophet, peace be upon him. Schmucko, we don't follow a cartoon. He's insulting the insulters of the prophet, peace be upon him. Order. Order in the Sharia court. It appears I, as Sharia judge, must make a decision in this case. Yes, it is true. We, we do not follow a cartoon. We follow an illiterate seventh century merchant who had the entire Quran dictated to him by the Archangel Gabriel. But we do not follow a cartoon. That would be silly. So, yes, he is insulting the insulters of the Prophet, peace be upon him. However, by using a cartoon of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to insult the insulters of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he is insulting the Prophet, peace be upon him. Therefore, I find you guilty of blasphemy and sentence you to be shot to death in a Paris office with 11 other innocent people. Sharia court is adjourned. Mr. Franken. That was another sketch from your 2016 Fringe show, which you cleverly titled Sharia Court Part 2. Mr. Franken, did you honestly believe people were going to laugh at these sketches? <laughs> no, I did not. You did not? So why in God's name would you put them in your show? I thought they were funny. I thought the first one was a nice commentary on the hypocrisy of the modern feminist and gay rights movements when it comes to their apathy regarding fundamentalist Islam. I felt the second was a nice commentary on the principle of free speech, and I felt those really illustrate the double standards of modern hate crimes legislation. I see. Were you aware, Mr. Franken, that it is considered a hate crime to make fun of hate crimes? No, I was not aware things would get that Orwellian. Orwellian? Now what is that, some sort of newfangled racial slur? <laughs> it's a reference to an author. An author! That's right, you like books. As a matter of fact, a book was found in your possession the night of your arrest, a book with a rather curious title, A History of Western Civilization, 4th Edition, which contains such scandalous content as that found under the head in the slave trade, and I quote, African Americans were often taken to the auction block. Is this the sort of thing you enjoy reading about, Mr. Franklin? I don't know if I enjoy it. It's just history. You know, it's just something that happened. It's the past. I see. So in your opinion, the past is just something that happened. Yeah. Uh, unless it's happening now, in which case it's the present. I see. So in your opinion, the present is something that's happening. Unless it hasn't happened yet, in which case it's the future. I see. So the future is something that hasn't happened yet. What hasn't happened yet, Mr. Franken? A few things. Um, the show's not over yet. Uh, that's, that's on a micro level. 
but on the macro level, there's a lot of things that haven't happened. Like, um, well, I don't think uh, women in certain parts of the world uh, have the same rights as women in the West uh, have. No, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, excuse me, Mr. Franklin. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly here. Uh, women in the West have rights. Is that? Is that is, were you aware, Mr. Franklin, a female McDonald's employee in the West? Still makes on average less than a male neurosurgeon. Were you aware of You talk about freedom, Mr. Franken. Freedom. Well, if you care about freedom so much, what about that Scottish family who nearly died of sexism? A <laughs> woman. What's for my tea? Nathan. Again. Joe, I'm so hungry. Why don't we take some money from our inheritance to buy some food for the bands and us? Nay, woman. Well, they use the money. In my house, the man pays. Aye, but you got their money, Jock. Aye, so until I get a new job, this family starves. Jock, I'm just thinking. Hey, woman, in my house, the man thinks. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. I've been doing the job center five times this week. Nay, Jock, you hardly been to the job center. Those are hallucinations brought about by intense hunger. I know. I've been to Tenerife ten times in the last door. Listen to me, woman. I am listening. Hey, woman, in my house, the man listens. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Joe, look, I've got money from your last job. Can we take that money and buy some food for the bands and us? Woman, you can't fool me. This is woman's money. Nay, Joe, it's man's money. Strong and proud and true, I could see. Nay, woman, in my house, the man sees. Woman's money. It's got a queen on it. Joe. <laughs> Joe, I'm speaking to you as your wife. Nay, woman, in my house, the man speaks to the man as the wife. Now, what's the matter? I'm so hungry. What are you going to do? Go to the job center. Fine, I'll go to the job center. I'm too weak to walk. I have to hallucinate. It's <laughs> coming into focus. And there's the man. Ah, oh, Mr. Majaga. Good to see you again, Mr. Majaga. Hey, you lost a bit of voice since I saw you last. Oh, Mr. Majaga, unfortunately, no one will hire you. There's a rumor going around town you're a bit of a sexist. Sexist? What cunt slag whore bitch slut said that? <laughs> uh, your wife, uh, she was done it last week looking for a job. She was looking for a job? That cunt slag whore slut bitch! It was not just your wife. It was not just your wife. Uh, your boss from the oil ring. Sexist on an oil ring? If a man cannot be sexist on an oil ring, well, can a man be sexist? That's the thing, Mr. Majaga. You're not supposed to be sexist anywhere. It's a bright new world. No sexist anywhere. You might as well ask the birds need to sing, or the children need to laugh, or the sun need to shine. Where can a man go to be sexist anymore and leave his wife crying on the floor? Maybe I'll go. Man can treat his woman just like a beast. It's getting hard to be a man these days. I don't understand this feminist craze. Where can a man go to loosen up and be the boy that he once was? Problem, Bess, I was living a lie, and that's why I wouldn't let you buy food for the bands and us. Well, I'm glad you finally told me, Jock. Sorry, Jockina, it's still awfully new to me. But how come it took you so long? Well, I couldn't even make up my mind. Was I a woman? Was I a woman? Then I realized I can't even make a decision. I must be a woman. Well, I'm glad you finally let me buy food for the bands and us, but I'm still stay hungry, hungry for cock. Nay, to worry, look what I got. A strap on, I'll put you on. Nay, woman, in my house, the woman that used to be a man puts on the strap. On. I can't wait to have you inside me. <laughs> It'll be a great union job. <laughs> Mr. Franken, this was the spot where you put another big X. Were you aware, Mr. Franken, this is a symbol of hatred, of racism, of bigotry and oppression? And so, were you aware of that? Fuck, man, I just thought it was a union jack. Oh. 
I guess it does kind of look like a Union Jack. I apologize, Mr. Franken. I, uh, I forgot you're the artist. I'm just a lawyer who talks his bullshit. Speaks a little gobbledygook. Does a little hip dip dip Mr. Captain speaking, uh, we're just uh, flown over the Spanish mainland, and yeah, we expect to be landing uh, in Ibiza Airport in about a half hour time. Hey folks, uh, I'm going to have to turn on the fasten seatbelt sign, we're getting ready to fly into a rainbow, so things might get a bit gay, oh my god, the colors are so beautiful, so <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Flight 909 struck a rainbow earlier and burst into a puff of glitter. <laughs> Little is known about the details of the accident, as the black box recording device retrieved from the crash site contains only music. Apparently one of the first class passengers, Sir Elton John, spent his last minutes of life composing new lyrics to an old standard. Goodbye, Elton John. Oh, I never knew me at all. I had the grace to hold myself while those around me fall. They fall down of the airplane. When the glitter began to rain, I was born Reginald, but I made me change my name. And it seems to me I live my life like a candle in the snow. This Boeing 737 is my final show. And I would have sung this for me, but I sung it for Lady D. A few years after I sung it for a woman named Norma Jean. Bam, 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 bam. No rainbows look nice on flags, but they are dangerous in the sky. Colors look beautiful until I realized I would die. I climaxed into glitter <laughs> along with all the other gays who went that way when the flight took off, but their straightness was erased. <laughs> and it seems to me I live my life like a ninja out on bail. I'm not sure what that means, but oh, what the hell. <laughs> Sing what I like, cause I'm the flying knight. This is my final flight, so I'll sing a load of shine. <laughs> That's what it is, isn't it, Mr. Frank? It's all big load of shite. You say I speak bullshit, well you speak bullshit. You talk about freedom. Well how free are you? How many packs of Rothmans did you chain smoke in your shitty London room to write that weak ass parody of an Elton John song? And how relevant is Elton John? The kids that come to comedy now, they want to hear about trance hop and bass house and hip hip and... I don't like that shit man, I like stuff from the past. Well that's right. Because the past, in your opinion, is just something that happened. Yeah, like you said that already, so that's the past. Oh, I see. So in your opinion, me saying the past, in your opinion, is just something that happened. It's just something that happened. Yeah, and you're doing it now, which makes it the present. I see. So in your opinion, me saying the past, in your opinion, is just something that happened. It's just something that happened. It's just something that's happening. <laughs> Mr. Frank, if we keep going round and round like this, I'm not going to have much of a future. <laughs> Look, man, I'm not the one on trial here today. One second, uh, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, Mr. Fragan, I'm sorry I wasted your time. Um, <laughs> yep, you're not on trial. Your trial's in the future. I thought it was in the present. I apologize, Your Honor. I guess my legal career is now something out of the past. No further questions. <laughs> Prosecution, you may continue with your closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have wasted a lot of time here today. <laughs> And I have sat by patiently, waiting for my colleague to realize his mistake. I gave him the freedom to do that, because I believe in freedom. I was one of the first lawyers to argue for the release of every single prisoner, no matter what they had done wrong. That was a mistake. But that was a mistake based in freedom. Because, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are very fortunate that we live in a free country. We are fortunate that we live in a country where we are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. We are fortunate that we live in a country where we are guaranteed the right to a fair and speedy trial by a jury of our peers. We are fortunate that we live in a country 
because there are a lot of people who do not live in a country. Those people live in the river, and those people are called fish. Now we can stand up here all day long and debate about whether a fish is actually a person. That's what the defendant, little Joe, would like us to do. Because that would mean we were giving some credence to his contention that when he drowned Melissa Molinaro the morning of the 5th of October, he couldn't tell the difference. Now you know and I know, and yes, little Joe knows, she was not a fish. Look at her. No fins, no gills. The autopsy proved conclusively she was not a fish. What was she? She was a talented actress. She gave us Nookie from Jersey Shore Shark Attack. <laughs> Had an uncredited role as a soldier's girlfriend in the 2002 thriller High Crimes. And will probably best be remembered for her role as Mrs. Witt, a woman dying of cancer who does not want Melissa Molinaro to play her in a movie about a life. <laughs> a life that little Joe stole! Little Joe is not some innocent northerner in a flat cap. He's a diabolical madman. We know before Will Franken came under his spell, Will Franken was one of the nation's leading family comedians, dealing lightheartedly in a variety of topics everyone could relate to. But under his tutelage, he became immersed in the arts of surrealist satire. <laughs> Little Joe, the same man who stole Farmer John's pig, cut it in half, took the top half of that pig, attached it to the top half of the rabbit, threw it to the wall to the left, as it spun round and round for all eternity. And that stood. Little Joe. Okay, that was from a show called Little Jack. I think it was Little, Little Jack. Little Jack by the Irish Irish comedian Phil Franklin. Uh, so um, you guys are the focus group, but this is where you help us at television with your input. So let me just ask: Would this be the sort of show that you would like to see on television? Yeah. Fuck no, that was bullish. That was just shit. What are we talking about? It's just shit. It was, it was just shit. Okay. 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 Um, <laughs> What sort of thing would you like to see on television? Same old shit we got now would be great. Okay, perfect. Um, Alison, what about you? I like the same old shit as well. Beverly? I love my same old shit. Please don't take away my same old shit. <laughs> what about you? What would you like to see on television? Oh, what about a show we got a pedophile that draws real shit cartoons? I'll show you that one. What else? <laughs> oh, what about a show we got a pedophile that helps kids fix shit? Don't think about that. Uh, what else? Um, oh, you have a show we got a pedophile. I think I'm going to pass the pedophile. Okay, well, um, same old shit we got now would be great. Okay, perfect. So what it sounds like is that you guys like shit, but you want it to be the same? Is that, yeah. I mean, I don't mind different as long as it's the same. And shit. I think I show I think I show career on that. I'm gonna care about guys also. It's shitting all over the screen in slow motion. I wouldn't mind seeing that shit. But it's not same old shit we got now, big right? Um, let me just ask. Are there any particular pieces of shit that we're shitting out now that you think is good shit? Yeah, I'll, I'll be like, what's that piece of shit where those shit comedians talk shit about what a piece of shit Nigel Farage is? I like that. That's good. What about that piece of shit where those shit comedians talk shit about what a piece of shit Donald Trump is? Yeah, those are both good. But I saw this piece of shit last night. These shit comedians did this shit with Donald Trump and Nigel Farage and one big piece of shit going around shit all over shit. That was some clever shit. I nearly shit myself. I think I know that piece of shit you're talking about. Okay, well, just to mix shit up, would you guys be interested in a piece of shit where shit comedians talk shit about what a piece of shit Jeremy Corbyn is. Oh, what a piece of shit Hillary Clinton is. Yeah, fine, no, that be shit, okay? Well, it sounds like you guys just want the same old shit, which is nice, because that saves us a lot of work and money. So thank you so much for coming in today. And, oh, I didn't see you back there with your flat cap. It's, um, it's Joe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Joe, what sort of thing would you like to see on television? <laughs> well, I read news today, old boy. It got me thinking, I like to see a show about a creature called Little Joe. <laughs> Top half Little Joe, Top half Donald Trump, and Top half Jeremy Corbyn. Bottom half Little Joe, Top half Hillary Clinton, and Top half Nigel Farage. <laughs> Four Top halves spinning round and round, and that story, a Little Joe. <laughs> not quite pig, not quite rabbit, not quite left, not quite right. Just stuck in the middle, getting out accomplished. Sound familiar? <laughs> Quite an unlikely story, but they're all true. Except for parts of made up, which I'm prone to do, given that I live all alone here in Caron with no one to bring me cake on my birthday. <laughs> Winter's coming. I don't mind, I quite like winter. Get some of that cloud dust. Oh, you know what cloud dust is, don't you? It's what my nan used to call snow. 
Nan didn't like wood snow. Reminded her too much of wood no. <laughs> Nan hated wood no. No one said no to Nan. Well, Granddad did once. Nan wanted Granddad to clean up blood stain on floor. Granddad said no. So Nan may do blood stain on floor, and that rendered Granddad. <laughs> no one said no to Nan. That Nan said no to no one. That's why they called her No No Nan. She said no to no one. That's why she was quite popular with sailors down at docks. <laughs> she could handle sailors. She knew all about discipline and bondage and humiliation and ball gags and leather corsets. She could charge up to 500 pounds for her services for sailors down at docks. That was one thing about Nan. She really knew how to turn you on. People were quite surprised to learn about Nan's reputation with sailors down at docks. They were more surprised to learn we had sailors in docks in the little landlocked village in Yorkshire. But times were different. Didn't have fancy navigation systems, so it weren't uncommon for ship to get lost on foggy nights, end up stranded out in the moors, after spending all night long tossing about on waves, going round and round and round and round. Mrs. Wynn, I'm Dr. Jason Posner. I understand your last doctor, Dr. Jason Posner, said that you were going to die. Is, is that correct, Mrs. Wynn? Yes, I'd like a second opinion. Okay, well, he was right. You are going to die. But um, I understand Melissa Molinaro is going to be playing you in a movie, so that's cool. Melissa who? Melissa Molinaro, she's great. How long do I have to live? Well, let's look at the file, Mrs. Whip. Oh, this is an old file. Um, apparently you did have three months to live, but, uh, well, that was six months ago, so, uh, I'm not trying to tell you this, Mrs. Whip, but apparently it looks like, well, you've been dead for three months. Welcome to the afterlife, Mrs. Witt. That's right, Mrs. Witt. This is the afterlife. The afterlife is you sitting in a doctor's office and being told that you've been dead for three months. You seem disappointed. That's not what they taught you in your fucking Bible school, is it? Well, wake up, bitch. This is fucking eternity and there's no getting out now. It's just you and me. Forever and ever and ever. Amen. Get used to it, girl. There ain't any coming back from this bitch. Round and round we go. I read news today, old boy. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> Witt died. She was me nan's housekeeper. And me nan's nan's housekeeper. And me nan's 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 housekeeper. She was getting on in years. So was me nan's nan's nan. Nan's nan's nan just turned 542 last Sunday. Went out to pay visit. Got in car with me children, me grandchildren. Me great grandchildren, me great great grandchildren, took a drive out to see Nan and Nan's Nan and Nan's Nan's Nan. Last time we were out there, took a great big photo of all family. Couldn't fit us all in photograph. And I take top half on me ancestors, attached it to top half on me descendants. <laughs> there were 742 generations in that photograph. There was Nan's Nan's Nan, Nan's Nan's Mom, Nan's Nan, Nan's Mom. My children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, all of us going round and round and round, everybody, and round and round and round and round and round and round. Thank you.